Zet uw microfoon aan, dan zullen we niet het geval zijn dat we horen dat events of summits. Uh, uh, I'd like to welcome all the members of the doctorate committee, Professor Jurik from the University of Sydney, from Saarlands University, uh, Professor uh, Roland Flemken from, from the Open University, Professor Carol Thijs. In this thesis, we focus on co-located or face-to-face -face collaboration. We have three different aims. Uh, in part one, not on what they actually speak, what is the actual content of the conversation. Some studies focusing on the content of the conversations are barely scratching the surface with the form of 14 different collaborative game design sessions to design a learning activity in a university. Each session had different phases, the group learning activity. This is an abstract architectural overview of the setup used. We collected audio data from each recordings to a central storage space for data processing, analysis and visualizations. Here we visualize the speaking time and turn taking of group members with different roles shown in different colors temporarily. The node size shown as colored surface or the line thickness between the nodes is proportional to how the group members exchange terms between them. We can observe here how the conversation patterns evolve with time. The epistemic space shows what is the actual content of the conversation. But I think it's not always clear that these indicators are the cause of that uh, good form. For example, uh, people that uh, uh, have a heated discussion about a particular subject, maybe wave their hands a lot. Uh, 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 parts. So either we can observe collaboration as a process, or we can observe collaboration as an outcome. And the way we observe that. But of course, um, apart from um, collecting this prior work and, and creating um, a systematics of methods uh, for analysis and facilitation of co-located uh, collaboration. Um, one would think uh, that uh, research work um, would contribute to um, yeah, a better understanding of the phenomenon of co-located collaboration and yeah, ultimately could create, modify or exhaust theories of uh, co-located collaboration and learning. So my question is, how would you describe, how do you, how does your work contribute to theory building? What kind of theory building can you allocate it somehow to a disciplinary background or also to, a, to existing um, uh, uh, work and theories? And maybe can you also exemplify that, not only in terms in general terms, in terms of you know, what is your understanding of your science, of your research as an epistemology, but also can you exemplify how you contribute with your work to this kind of theory building? with your present work and maybe also with your future work yeah? as you're building a, a groundwork for that has, I believe, lots of potential for, for future work. Maybe you can yeah, um, exemplify that as well. Okay. Uh, highly learned opponent. Uh, thank you for this question. So uh, if I understand your question correctly, you you want to know how my contribution, my work's contribution, can uh, uh, contribute to theory building in co-located collaboration and also maybe modify the theories uh, that are already existing in that field. Is it so? Okay. Yes. What is your understanding of theory building? How exactly? 
does your work contribute to this kind of theory building? What theories are we actually talking about? Mm. And yeah, and maybe you can also exemplify and also look into the future in this regard, but we can also come back to that later and I can call again on this question. Okay. Uh, so the way I will answer this question is, uh, first of all, uh, we did not uh, specifically uh, focus on any learning theory uh, when when we did the literature review. But uh, uh, let me also give you a brief background. So because I come from a computer science background, so I really jumped into the uh, the sensor part, which was more fascinating and attracting for me in the beginning. And I also got a lot of support from my supervision team. So because I jumped to that, so the theories that come from the learning science part, which I have got a lot of criticisms from many different communities. So uh, that part, I never really focused on any learning theory when building that uh, top down and bottom up approach in the literature review. And we really kind of, I don't know the exact word, but something like what was already done, like the what we just see on the surface, like what was done, like what you get from the sensors, and then you have the scenarios. So to me, I feel that even though it doesn't have any theories, that kind of work will be useful if someone is a very beginner in setting up a face-to-face -face collaboration task and they want to really understand uh, how can we measure something and what can we measure, then this will be like a very good glimpse. It will give a very good glimpse to understand like, okay, suppose in meeting we can focus on speaking time or uh, in brainstorming, we can focus on how many ideas people are giving. So this is more like, I would say, like on the surface, you have this as a as a, a drawing drawing mechanism, like it draws your attention to your to that field of work. And then maybe side by side of my literature review, you can go to certain learning theory and then see whether this supplements or doesn't help at all like what how but to be honest i didn't look into any learning theory so uh, for the way the literature is developed i don't think it modifies or adds to any theory but if we see side by side then maybe something might come up uh, with it that would be my answer to you so so this would basically argue for multidisciplinary projects in which there are multiple uh, people or perspectives realized in which there is groundwork done on a technological side that of course then enables a much broader perspective on from the learning science perspective um, and you are of course then building theory in terms of uh, computer science uh, 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 background and, and tradition. And, but, but maybe let me get back to this um, little addendum of a question to exemplify how that then would work together. So what would be the next steps in your research and how would that then interplay with theory building in the learning sciences and how would theory building in the learning science then create you know or then inspire your research and and you know advance your theory building in in uh, um, uh, from your disciplinary background and of course this is very difficult now to to allocate because we might be thinking in disciplines and we are already a little bit beyond that as a as the field being interdisciplinary in a way. But maybe you can exemplify what would these next steps be and how would this give direction to your research in terms of yeah, a multidisciplinary or even an interdisciplinary understanding of, of uh, advancing research for co-located collaboration. Please assure it's an answer. 
Oh, okay. Uh, I will try to keep it short. Uh, uh, I think I will be telling the same thing in a different way, highlighting certain different aspects. So, uh, if we see like particular, like let's take the example of the speaking time. Just like uh, Johan asked about the the speaking time, like uh, when we see it as a post test, how do we know that that is like? I mean, that is one way of measuring it. But if you really want to understand in depth, like what happened during the process, and can we really link collaboration process to the outcome? Like, if we want to really go in depth into what happened in the process, like. An ideal process would have equality of members, but in some cases also one dominant member solve the task. Then I think in those kind of exceptions, if we have a particular learning theory, like a specific uh, theoretical perspective to it, then it will be helpful to understand also like what was actually, why these exceptions happened, like uh, what was the reason for it. That's how I could say in short. Uh, I don't know if it answered your question. Thank you very much. Uh, we continue the opposition with uh, Dr. Flammer. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, presentation and for the thesis. So I cannot let you from the hook. Yeah? So I'm a computer scientist by myself. Yeah? So, um, but I'm deeply convinced that Professor Weinberger is very right. Yeah? So, and uh, my question would be, uh, uh, about a particular uh, learning theory, we're talking about communities of practice. You heard about that? Uh, sorry, can you please repeat? Communities of practice. Uh, no. Okay, we did a little, little, little tutorial. Yeah. So, so what you said um, is that um, your collaboration quality is, is highly uh, scenario dependent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And. Um, uh, community of practice researcher would say yes. It's no wonder why, because uh, it's deeply dependent on the domain, mm -hmm. the community, and the practice. Yeah, so, and now, if you would contextualize your research yeah, in that terms, community, practice, and domain. Yeah, so, would it be possible to have a, a definite Catalog of uh, call it located collaboration quality criteria, which is true for every community or for every practice for every domain, or would you more things that is um, have to be specialized or embedded or localized in the community? So, what do you think? Uh, highly learned opponent. Uh... Going into the community of practice definition that you gave. Uh, so I will answer in two parts. So I can say, like, if I just go to the terminology, let me just, for my understanding, let me just map the terminology that you used for community of practice to the terminology that I use in my co located scenario thing. So suppose you say domain, I think domain will map to scenarios of collaboration that we had. And the community, I am not sure if I understand correctly, I think community is more like the group, like the group characteristics of the group members that are there in that particular meeting. And uh, practice, I think we'll have the actual discussion of the task or what comes out of the collaboration, right? So, I mean, terminology wise, obviously we are already seeing as we agree the, the mapping, uh, I mean the match. But again, if I want to say that this can be generalized across communities, I think it will be again domain specific, just like I said they are like scenario specific, because in that particular scenario or the way I define that task or measure the outcome or the process of the task, it really depends on that because as I gave example, like in some engineering design tasks of collaboration, there are lot, there's a lot of uh, inter, uh, like you interact lot with objects, physical objects, then tracking the gesture 
posture in those kind of scenarios, whatever was found in the literature, was more meaningful to understand what was happening instead of tracking audio there. So that is why if we, I mean, that is why I find it difficult to generalize because depending on the nature and the type of the task, it will really depend what modalities and what kind of uh, indicators we can track in that. So I don't think at least as per my understanding that this can be generalized across communities. The way I see it. Okay, thank you very much. I, I would uh, argue against it yeah, a, a little bit, uh, depending on my research, but uh, nevertheless, um, I, I have um, a second uh, question, which is uh, targeting at uh, social network analysis. Yeah. Mm. So uh, interestingly enough, yeah. So uh, the first studies about uh, social network analysis have been performed by uh, anthropologists from Harvard University in the 30s. Yeah, it was this famous Hawthorne. Uh, bank wiring study, yeah, so where they studied collaboration of workers um, wiring, uh, and uh, they did uh, position analysis, uh, uh, who is standing where in this collaboration scenario, and who is uh, friend with whom, and uh, does that have an impact on the quality of, of collaboration, yeah, so in the 1930s, yeah, so um, the sensors have been humans, yeah, so uh, the old-fashioned way, yeah. So, um, so my question is: um, You have done social network analysis uh, based on co-occurrence of words in, in this content analysis, and um, to what I have understood for social network analysis as a computer scientist, that uh, the analysis of social factors outperform any content-based measures, yeah, what you call epistemic measures, yeah. But in your work, you say, yeah, we have to move more from social measures to epistemic measures. Yeah? So, so how would you argue against this result from social network analysis that it's more interesting who is talking to whom, who is friend to whom, uh, and not so interesting what they are talking about? Mm -hmm. uh, highly learned opponent. So, um, first of all, uh, the the way we i will just repeat it because i'm not sure if i'm clear on that so uh, regarding the definition of the way i defined it in the thesis uh, the social and the epistemic so uh, i mean the example that i gave that was only having like the speaking time and turn taking of the group members in the social space and in the epistemic space the actual words and the co-occurrence and everything that happened in the discussion so, uh, what we found from the, from the different studies is that, uh, so another thing I also want to clarify, I wanted to interrupt during the question, but I could not, is that what I did, I mean, it is quite kind of paradoxical to call it like, uh, I just call it network analysis because I am doing network analysis of the words and it is popularly called as social network analysis, but then if I call the network graph that I built, if I call that a social network analysis, to me it sounds very strange. Because it's not meant, it is more of a friendship between the, Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, so the that is why I, I don't know if I have by mistaken anywhere mentioned it, but I tried to remove the social word because I am focusing more on the content. And I just mentioned, if you see also my presentation, I mentioned network graph, network analysis, because I had that in the first phase everywhere I had social, and then I thought like it will be very strange too. So I feel, still feel the, I mean, you said that friendship and the relation is important as compared to what they speak, but especially in collaboration. When we had that PhD meeting, where we had this real-time feedback. That was never meant to actually test the efficacy of the feedback and everything. It was just to get a feel of what is happening, how fast can we build something, can we try it out, how does it look like. So there we saw like, like if we just take the speaking time example, specifically in PhD meeting, 
like what do we actually gain out of it like if we just show speaking time there we show speaking time you can also go far further to show the time taking with some fancy mode as graph but what really we don't understand anything because i mean again that also brings back the press brings back to defining the task that was more like an open task like what we did in psd meeting but we just see like okay promoter is dominant or maybe in that particular meeting one of the student one of the PhD student is dominant but then how do we understand like like suppose we, i see like in first 10 minutes he was dominant because he was replying to someone's question or he was explaining something about a specific task or a topic so with that small example i would argue that uh, it is important in certain Cases, certain scenarios to to understand also the if we just see only the social space like the synchrony and amplitude or this kind of speaking time we don't get the full understanding of what is happening during the value that will be my view. Thank you. Hey. We'll continue the observation. Thank you. Esteemed candidate, uh, thanks for the thesis that you've written that I enjoyed uh, reviewing and uh, thanks for the research report therein. Um, I have, of course, also some questions about your research. Um, human beings can learn. I mean, we can agree on that, but they cannot only learn to improve themselves. They can also learn to pretend improving. When we, for instance, measure the quality of scientists, we apply measures like number of publications, how often do you get cited? And then we can observe that scientists start to slice their research results into several papers and publications, and that they start to um, create communities of people who cite each other, and none of that actually improves scientific quality. It just pretends to improve that. Now, with your measure of, of um, collaboration that you, that you apply, we can expect the same to happen, probably. So people who know that their collaboration uh, is being measured can pretend to collaborate better. Um, are you aware that that risk might, uh, might uh, occur or that, that there is this risk that people actually pretend to be good collaborators while they actually are not? And how would you want to, pre uh, to prevent that from happening? Okay, uh, highly learned opponent. That's a very interesting question. So, uh, I mean, I am aware of this because when we had the first uh, PhD meeting where we did the wizard of uh, old study, then during the meeting we also discussed like, okay, I mean, we know that there's a human observer in the other room whom we cannot see, but I mean, that was not at all for publication, I mean, like for measuring the efficacy of the feedback, but still we knew that there was a person sitting in the, the other room. So then obviously you'll be more conscious, like you mentioned about mimicking. So you'll be more conscious about uh, seeing like how you look in that board. Like suppose it is showing speaking time and maybe the plant plant example will be best so suppose uh, people want to grow their plants really well in, in the meeting you see always like plant is not going well and my friends plant is really growing well then you start also to uh, fall in line with that but my take will be like if we see it from that perspective then how do we i mean a question comes to my mind like how we can uh, measure the pretense like at some point the person who is pretending the way i see it will already be in, in that uh, the track or that collaboration what he's supposed to do so how can we really actually demarcate this is 20 percent pretense and 80 percent collaboration or this is 90% pretense and 
ten percent. I mean, with, whether it is more pretends, less collaboration, or I mean, at some point he will reach a point where he will be collaborating already well. So I don't know if we can really capture it. But one solution that comes to my mind is like maybe if we have now we only focus on audio. Maybe if we have uh, more modalities, somehow we can see the co-occurrence. Like suppose you see the EDS signal and it is maybe noisy and it gives you something which can be interpreted in both ways. And then you also have the facial expression. And probably I think maybe if we have multiple modalities, more than one modality, then maybe we can catch that. Or I mean, we can never say for sure whether it is pretense or not pretense, but we can somehow improve our analysis or how we measure the quality. So yeah, so that's how I would frame my answer. I mean, we could probably also relate it more to the to the outcomes of collaboration in the terms of, I mean, collaboration within a meeting, within a session is one thing, but it's done for a purpose also, mm -hmm. right? And we, we could try to measure also the quality of the result that a, yeah. a collaboration achieves, and that can probably not so so easily be pretended. And that, that probably relates it a bit to the introduction question from, from Johan. Um, but I would have a follow-up question in the direction of the actual learning and how we, or how we use that system, how you envision such an approach would be used in the future. So for instance, uh, would you expect that every every collaboration space that we have, every classroom, every meeting room, every whatever collaboration space we we might uh, we might be in, would be equipped with such measurement technology, and we would more or less permanently observe, or is there an approach where we have probably a training phase, and we are observed in that training phase until we reach a state uh, a status that we are professional collaborators and then we can we can basically do that and don't need to be monitored anymore um, on on what we are doing how do you envision that how would your your approach been taken into practice uh, highly land opponent I feel I would just go to the last part of the question then I'll come back to the first part so I feel that if we uh, if you train uh, groups, to behave in a certain way, I think that will already bring in pretense, right? Like, uh, if you already know what you are doing, there is a theory behind that. I don't know the name of that theory, so I heard once. So if you already know how, I mean, because the way I we are doing what we did in the study also, we said that it's a field test because we want to go out from the lab settings and. Uh, go for suppose you have a collaboration in a classroom or collaboration in some PhD meeting or something which is very natural that we don't want to I, I think that if we have that then it will cause that issue one issue and going to the first part of your question regarding the, the way I summarize it it's more like how many hardware equipments will be how convenient it will be what is the cost of these sensors like suppose you take few groups to a room so I think recently in last year lab conference, there was a publication from Burton Snyder. They developed the EZ MMLA toolkit, which is more like increasing the accessibility, affordability of the sensor. So instead of having like suppose a Microsoft Kinect, which tracks your posture depth within all the different type of gestures and postures, they take help of this web camera, any cheap web camera, and they have this machine learning and deep learning algorithms to take help of a normal microphone. This, I mean, basically you can take your laptop and if you, they have a very nice website where they have kept everything in GitHub and everything you can download and play with it. So this kind of already improves that if we can really take hold of the sensors that we are always carrying every day, like suppose we have the phone or we have the laptop and if you can take advantage of these already available things, then I think that will cause a lot less overhead on relying on these kind of hardware infrastructure or cost and everything. So that, that would be my answer for the convenience part, if I understand that.
Thank you. Go further to the uh, list of comments. Uh, Professor Reins. Quite a journey. Yeah. Quality of collaboration and co working. And that's exactly what my first question is about the quality of collaboration. In measurement theory, you know, uh, they make a distinction between how constructors define <coughs> and how constructors measure. And uh, regarding uh, and that, oh. So for all those who didn't hear it, in measurement theory, there is a distinction between how a construct is, yeah, is, is described and defined and how it is measured. And uh, how it is defined means that there is something like a latent variable uh, that expresses that uh, construct. And then uh, knowing how it is defined, we can operationalize it in measurable terms. So, uh, in the reading your dissertation, it, uh, uh, yeah, uh, I saw that you ha actually have done a two-step operationalization of quality of collaboration. Namely, you have first set up a, a, a space of indicators and indexes, which is your first step. And the second step in your operationalization is how to uh, uh, observed or how to measure those uh, indexes. For example, uh, speech time is one indicator, and then you take a microphone and you measure the time somebody is, is talking, eh? or, or you count the number of ideas. And uh, okay, that is uh, so far so good. But uh, yeah, but still I'm very interesting how a definition would be of quality of collaboration. And then I mean it uh, something in terms like uh, there is uh, transactivity or there is knowledge building, uh, uh, like you have defined uh, what uh, collaborative learning is. Huh? It was a simple sentence. Would you give me in simple terms what you would understand about or how would you define quality of collaboration without naming indexes and, and, and indicators and such things. Hmm. Uh, highly learned opponent. Uh, mm, thank you for this thoughtful question. So, uh, the, uh, I will go back to my funnel shape that I showed, like the top down and the bottom up approach. So you say that I should not use the word indicators and indexes, which is kind of the coming from the sensors, the bottom up approach. Then we can go from the top down approach. From if, the you would, if you would meet a lay person, okay. and you would to explain, I did my research on quality of collaboration, co-located collaboration. Okay. And you have to tell him, you have to explain him in, in, uh, in a few words what you did. What is quality of collaboration in co-located uh, So the way I would define it, I won't go into this technical jargon of these words, whatever I used. I will probably give you a simple example. So I can say like, okay, you are having, you are in a meeting in a room and uh, everyone is speaking. And if we see that all of you are more or less speaking equal amount of time or uh, then the quality is good. But if we see that one of the persons just speaking for the half an hour and rest of them are not speaking, then quality is not good. So, I would go with that simple example and not stress anything on indicator indexes, scenarios, contextualization, all these things. So that would be my simple way of saying, because I feel comfortable in any kind of layman talk. It is much easier when we just focus on the example 
then they can relate more to their everyday happening because they also know that okay we are in a meeting everyone is going to talk not bothered about sensors and all these things so i feel giving a simple example will be the easiest way and then later if you have more curiosity then we can go to deeper why speaking time no no here speaking time is not good there it is good so something like that okay now we go to more in the index and, and indicators and the visualizations okay. of your quality of uh, yeah. collaboration on page 106 you have put and also in the presentation a network graph yeah. uh, in which you can see the relation between or the frequency of used words and the connection between the next word so I was staring at that uh, network and I tried to figure out what are they talking about in this graph and can I uh, uh, see from that graph whether there is quality of collaboration. So uh, maybe you could show that picture again. I do not know if it is easy, but you know what I mean. Uh, no, the, no, I the, 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 the graph yeah, yeah. and uh, I was staring at it and how can I see from that graph that there is quality mm. in the collaboration happening in the group? Okay, uh, just to make it clear, I I don't think I ever. I mean, we don't. I don't say here that uh, I don't claim that this graph. So this graph is like one of the many things that can help us to move towards quality detection. But obviously, this doesn't give us any idea. So the main idea behind building this graph was uh, if you see it in small temporal snapshots, because this graph, the dashboard that we had, if we see it for 30 minutes, it becomes so complex and you cannot understand anything. I mean, even the words, the way they overlap, even if you use some kind of space optimization there are many algorithms then also you don't get an idea about what was happening there so this graph was more to get an understanding like the phrases that co-occur together and then maybe role wise you can see like oh, suppose the teacher was supposed to speak this word then what happens or if someone else was going to speak that word then what happens yeah thank you very much thank for you. the answers uh, the defense committee will now um, retire and go back to the common room for deliberations. We'll be back in a few minutes. I mean, I have no feelings. It's just finished. I mean, whatever. Oh, okay. We, I just leave it like that. Can I keep it somewhere or leave it here?
the doctor, doctor report represented here by the defense committee uh, has decided to award you uh, the doctorate. And your supervisor, Professor Specht, uh, has been authorized to confer this honor to you. By virtue of the powers vested in us by Dutch law in accordance with the decision of the doctorate board, I confer on you, Samit Praharaj, the title of doctor and all the rights and all duties to science and society associated with the Dutch law or custom to a PhD degree at the Open University of the Netherlands. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of academic integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, critical and transparent, independent and impartial? As a proof of this PhD degree, I present you with this certificate signed by the Rector Magnificus, Chair and Supervisors, along with a copy of your PhD thesis signed by all members of the Defense Committee present here today. Professor Spertus will provide you the laudatio. Dear Dr. Praraj, Sambit, it's been quite a journey. Happy to be here with you today. I was thinking about some challenges you had on the way and with the help of Hendrik and Maren, we collected some of the, the stories of your journey. So when we started, I, I remember we just had hired a very successful uh, candidate, recent colleague of you, Joanna uh, Givet, who, who, who just defended also, and we thought, oh, there is another candidate from the TU Delft. We must get this guy. And we really started up and were enthusiastic, so were you. And then a first challenge came. Somebody started to talk about methodology and learning sciences and all these uh, crazy things. And even the first methodology for your study uh, was a Wizard of Oz study. So you might have thought we want to get to go to the movies instead of doing some scientific research. But all that you managed and worked into a nice experiment for your first publication. At the first publication, we had no AI, although you came from that background, you worked on these things and you wanted to investigate, but we really had to find also an agreement as an interdisciplinary team. So after that, we started to set out for the second challenge, a literature review. And I think as you presented today with your bottom-up and top-down approaches, this was a really complex and inter interdisciplinary endeavor. And uh, it took a long time and many revisions and a lot of feedback from the community to work on this. But I'm very proud on your final result re being published. And this also has been seen in the other publications you got. So we see that convergence that you referred to also in the, in the teamwork we did and the effort you investigated. So I think this, this is a really nice success for this second challenge you have been confronted with. And then a third challenge happened to all of us and COVID uh, happened and Sambit had to do uh, research on co-located collaborations. So nobody wanted to be collaborated. Everybody was doing remote online learning uh, and you had to do studies in face-to-face -face meetings. Of course, this was a huge challenge. So also for you, we had to reframe, rethink uh, your indicators, your measures, 
how do they apply to online learning? How can we map this? And um, I think you showed today that you, did, you handled this uh, challenge and did this uh, next step with your framework and the work you applied it in the games of your colleagues and friends and paralympics also. So one of the outstanding qualities of your work, I think, is collaborating with many people and many partners. Not only studying the collaboration between people, but especially also building a network. You have one very, uh, many friends here. You worked with uh, different networks, with different uh, universities, with DIPF, with the Nell Institute, with Singapore, with Teo Delft, and all there you embedded your research ideas and your further development. So I think that's another uh, real nice achievement of your work. At the end, I think a lot of this COVID discussion also led to the already mentioned work together with Marcel Schmitz uh, from the Hochschule Sart and his, his game in co-creation and using this as an exemplar scenario. And I think you demonstrated with your publications to the LAC22 conference where you have uh, full paper accepted and the other publications, the quality of your work. So congratulations on that again. Some side notes that you are a very successful networker can be seen on your YouTube channel. Because, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if you know, but he has 12,700 followers on his YouTube channel. So uh, this is a real achievement. And I'm not sure if there is also probably a hidden career for you in becoming a very successful YouTuber. And you have a lot of topics you talk about. Like, you really thought a lot on doing a PhD in the Netherlands and what that experience is. And um, also on completely different topics, like probably you could become a professional online chef because you have a lot of recipes and excellent food uh, on, your, on your YouTube channel. So in short, you come to a place of choice. You also had your uh, Inbürgerings examen, so uh, congratulations also for that. What a journey, I would say. I wish you all success with your further journey, and well done, Sambit. I also like to congr congratulate the young doctor um, on behalf of the doctorate board. Uh, I like to uh, congratulate the supervisors uh, with uh, with this result and paranyms um, by supporting you uh, today. Um, I'd like to thank the members of the committee uh, for their questions and for uh, their participation. Uh, I'd like to thank the audience for being here and for the audience uh, at home. Um, and at the end of this session, because we don't see Professor Weinberger and we don't see Hendrik, who is missing the, the ball, um, uh, we uh, provide them uh, some time to say some words to you. Uh, Professor Weinberger, the floor is yours. Yes, dear Dr. Bradach, it was a pleasure. Congratulations, first of all, um, to your uh, um, uh, promotion. It was a pleasure to learn more about your work. I think it is of high potential. We're also interested in, in looking at co-located collaborative learning using multiple modalities. And of course, there's, there's lots of potential in developing this further and to gaining new understanding of embodied cognition and how people share a gaze and, and, and share attention on, on representations of knowledge and all of this these things and I'm sure we will meet at some point hopefully in better times and can discuss this further and who knows maybe at some point collaborate all the best wishes to you and your future 
thank you for sharing your work, which is really impressive in in its uh, in its rigor and and in its uh, yeah uh, the 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 way it encompasses it uh, quite a, quite a few of of approaches and sensors and technological ideas. So thank you very much. All the best for you. Thank you very, uh, very much, Professor Weinberger. And finally, uh, Hendrik. Dambit, I'm so sorry to not be there. You cannot imagine. Um, but this is also how COVID played us right from the middle of your PhD. It was, you, to be honest, you have been the most challenging PhD project with, in, in concerns with COVID because uh, we actually had an experiment ready, done, um, planned, and then COVID happened, and uh, a lot of things have not been possible, and we, I think we easily lost four to six months on this, and this has been really a, a challenge, but um, I'm, I'm so proud of you, too, and uh, especially with your network and collaboration with Marcel and others at OU, you addressed this and, and switched to online collaboration. And um, uh, you're now final here, um, and, and congrats for this. This is really fantastic. And um, yeah, and, and I think the virus really gave us the last bits to infect me and not being here. So they really treated us hard. Um, but congratulations and all the best for your future. Um, uh, and, and the last achievement at your presentation at LAC for sure, what will be another milestone to take, right? So congrats from me. I'm, I'm really glad to see you there. Okay, thank you very much. And with this, um, we'll end this academic uh, session. And uh, I wish you all a very nice weekend.